Welcome to episode 25 of America in Crisis, Breaking the Cycle of Addiction. My name is David Hunt and I am your host. Please set your DVRs to record. This show could save your child's life. Today's special guest is Amber Pelletier. Amber was with us in 2019 when the vaping epidemic was just beginning. As more students and young people are trying this dangerous habit for the first time, we're learning more about the dangers of this deadly trend. I decided to bring Amber back to our studio to share what has been learned since then. Amber is the Division Director of Health Promotion for the American Lung Association in Massachusetts. She is responsible for developing and implementing educational programs for lung cancer, COPD, asthma, and other lung diseases throughout the eastern United States. She currently serves on the Steering Committee for Massachusetts Asthma Action Partnership and the Massachusetts Comprehensive Cancer Steering Committee. Amber received her bachelor's degree in social work from the University of Maine and her master's degree in social work with a focus on nonprofit management from the University of South Carolina. Amber, welcome back to my show. Hi, David. Great to be here. Now, a lot has happened over the last two years. Let's start off with telling our viewers, what is vaping? Yeah, so vaping, you know, you hear all of these different terms, jeweling, e-cigarettes, e-pens, e-devices. So they all kind of fall under this umbrella of e-cigarettes. And so what e-cigarettes do is they are a battery operated device that heat this liquid and this liquid we call it e-juice. It comes in cartridges, they're usually disposable. And that e-juice contains nicotine. Uh, so that is extracted from tobacco. It also contains a wide array of additives and chemicals. The, <clears throat> the products aren't regulated, so the chemicals and the compounds kind of vary, but they're heated up and kind of inhaled into the lungs by the user. And so obviously it's problematic because you have all those chemicals going into your lungs. And, and I will say some of the products, people think they're just harmless water vapor and and it's been found that even the devices that say they don't contain nicotine mm -hmm. actually do have trace amounts of nicotine. So, so people who are using it and think maybe they're not getting that, they are, unfortunately. How did this product come about? I thought it was a smoking cessation device. Why are we using it to start? <laughs> yeah, so actually what's really funny is the e-cigarette as we know it, it initially there in 1927, a gentleman called named Joseph Robinson, he created the first electric vaporizer and it was to kind of use with medical compounds. Now he was way ahead of his time and so nothing really took off back in the 1920s when he started this. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you kind of fast forward to 2003, there was a Chinese pharmacist right along the lines of what you were saying. He wanted to quit using traditional cigarettes, tobacco products. He was smoking three packs a day and his father had passed away from lung cancer and he wanted to quit. So he kind of invented this new e-cigarette and thought it would help him in that kind of endeavor to, to start his quit journey. And unfortunately, he did not end up quitting. He became a dual user. So oh. now he uses traditional cigarettes alongside the vaping product that he you know, initiated. So I think it started out in that way, but it definitely did not turn out um, mm -hmm. having the positive impact that they thought maybe it could have. Now, the Surgeon General states that e-cigarettes contain nicotine and harmful chemicals such as heavy metals. Can you tell our viewers what e-cigarettes are made of and how they work? What's in these things? Yeah, so I think, you know, it just kind of <clears throat> depends on what product you're using. The, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, they have not reviewed e-cigarettes or vaping devices as a whole. So what is in each device or in each e-juice cartridge, it varies so widely. But what we do know is that they all kind of contain a couple of groups of things. So the first being nicotine, which comes from tobacco, obviously, and it's a highly addictive chemical. Then there's also a wide array of other chemicals from propylene gly uh, glycol, which is a food additive, mm. to diactol, to carcinogens. Uh, you name it, it's, it's in there. And then there's all these flavorings and additives and those sorts of things. So, you know, the device heats up these, they're in a liquid form, turns them into aerosol, you inhale them into your lungs, and, and you get that feeling that you would from a cigarette, this, you know, from the nicotine, this little buzz. Now, we hear a lot about secondhand smoking. What about vaping? If someone's vaping in my car, should I worry? Yeah, so I think this is a <clears> common <throat> question. You know, a lot of these vapes, that, like I said, they have these flavors to them. You'll see bubble gum and, and all these different things. And so I think people think, oh, the person using it will have these side effects and not others because it disappears into the air and it smells good. How could it be bad for me? And unfortunately, 
that's not the truth. You can, you can get kind of some effects of secondhand smoke, but from secondhand vaping and, and taking in that aerosol that goes into the air, all of those chemicals that I mentioned, all of those compounds and carcinogens, if people are blowing that out into the air mm -hmm. and then you're taking that in, it's bad for your body as well. There actually was a report released recently by the Surgeon General okay. that stated that that could um, kind of have some effects almost similar to asthma yeah. or um, similar to secondhand smoke that just have this acute lung injury that you obviously don't want as a bystander. Speaking of the Surgeon General, he states that uh, anybody under the age of 25, this can affect their brain for kids and anybody under the age of 25. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so the big piece is that these devices, like I said, they contain nicotine. And so nicotine is obviously highly addictive, but it's known to impact adolescent brain development. So when youth or anyone under 25 is using an e-cigarette or a vaping device, they're taking nicotine into your, their body. And so that affects things like their memory, their concentration, their ability to make decisions you know, the, the, it impacts self-control and so on. But I think what's troubling for me and what's troubling yeah. for the American Lung Association is also the fact that these products, they have kind of two other negative consequences. Okay, please share. <laughs> yeah, so it, it impacts obviously your brain and, and other parts of your body, but also um, it's been found that youth who use e-cigarettes are more likely to down the road use traditional tobacco mm -hmm. products, number one. So it kind of creates this new life cy cycle of addiction. Uh, but it also has been shown that youth who use e-cigarettes are more likely to engage in other addictive behaviors or have other addictions down the road outside of tobacco products. So our focus on kind of not wanting youth to vape, wanting mm. to do some preventative things to make sure that youth aren't vaping, that focus comes from thinking about the long-term impact that this will have on, our, on our, these generations. So they're starting vaping and then they want to move on to something else when if it was to pick up a traditional cigarette, people, I mean, we're all educated, we all know what cigarettes do to people. Mm -hmm. Most kids say, I'm not gonna touch that, it'll get lung cancer, it'll get into my lungs, they know enough to stay away, at least we hope they do. Mm -hmm. Vaping, oh, that's harmless. So they're basically saying, I'm going to try this. And then when that's not good enough for them, okay, then maybe I'll try smoking. Am I exactly. So they just kind of move on to the next thing because after a while they, they get used to it. They get used to the impacts it has and, and they're not really feeling that sensation that maybe they have been with the e-cigarettes so they move along. Well, it's like the cocaine deal. You get the first hit of cocaine. Supposedly you never, ever, ever can get that big hit back. What it releases in the brain, it does it once and it will never do it again. So you're trying always to get that original high that you just can't duplicate. Mm -hmm. So you're taking more and more and more. So I can see how a vicious cycle starts there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, how many people are vaping and at what ages? Yeah, so I think what's the most troubling right now is the rate at which youth are vaping. So about 11% of all middle school students vape and about 28% of high school students are vaping. And, and why that's troubling is this has been a jump over the last two to three years from going from about 15% of youth to jumping up to around 20 to 28% of, of high school students now vaping. And I think the comparison would be in general, adults over the age of 18 have about 3.5 2% have tried a vaping product or are currently using a vaping product. At least, uh, uh, you know, the range between, I guess, 25-year-old people to 44, usually between 17 and 18% of them are vaping. So really, the vast majority of, of e-cigarette users are high school students, which is troubling because they're not even of age to use this it to what, begin I was, with. I was just going to ask is how are they getting these things? You got to be 18 or 21 to get them. How are high school kids 12, 13 getting this stuff? So they're very creative. I will <clears throat> say in Massachusetts, obviously everything has been thrown off because of COVID, mm. but typically we have a kick butt stay uh, down at the state house where we're able to talk to legislators uh, with youth throughout the state who are kind of fighting back against big tobacco and, and youth using these products. And what we have heard in those meetings with with legislators is about how youth are creative and how you know especially now that tobacco 21 um, has passed in the state and you have to be 21 to buy products um, it makes you kind of scratch your head and think how are they getting these because there's no one in the high school who would be old enough and so I think there is a lot of people asking older siblings older family members older friends to purchase them um, 
you know, people not being carted at stores mm -hmm. and, and purchasing them that way. There also um, was a lot of cases, and, and I'm not sure if this is still um, happening, but people were able to buy the products online. Yeah. And they would purchase them with gift cards and have mm -hmm. them shipped to a friend's house when they knew a parent wasn't going to be home yeah. and, and so on. So I think people have gotten really creative. Yeah. But I'll, I'll, you know, I'll also compare it to you think about youth using alcohol, you yeah. know, when they're in high school. They're not old enough to purchase that and they find ways to do it. So I think, you know, youth have been, um, I guess, a little bit creative yeah. in figuring out how to get the products, but they are getting their hands on them. Um, it makes you wonder, I mean, during the middle of COVID, we couldn't buy toilet paper, but <laughs> we can get our vaping products to yes, kill ourselves. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of uh, vaping products, what do they look like? What do they come in? For the people that have never even seen a vaping product, I thought I, I know the old ones had the big tin things. Mm -hmm. And now, how do you hide them? What are they found in? Yeah, so they, they have gotten so progressive and have honestly uh, made it very easy to conceal vaping products. So they started out and they were like these thick metal boxes. Yeah, I remember those. And they were heavy and, and people, if you <clears throat> saw them, were kind of like, what in the world is that? And now they've kind of progressed into these different, they call them generations of products where you may have seen them and they look like actual pens. Mm -hmm. um, but then I think for youth, primarily what people are using is the Juul and, mm -hmm. and some of these other products that are sleek and they're skinny, they look like USB yeah, drives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're, they're easy to conceal, <clears throat> but then there are even products that you would have no idea. Um, there are hoodies that the strings on them you can vape out of. You're kidding me. And, and there are backpacks that have the same sort of thing where there's a little piece that comes out of it and you can vape through your backpack. So, you know, there have been all these progressions and, and this kind of move forward to make these products easy to conceal so people don't know what you're doing. And because of those flavors and the smells, people don't know because of that too. So it's just very interesting and very troublesome. Yes, I keep forgetting it's a cessation device <laughs> marketed to adults, but I don't know how many kids, uh, adults rather would use tutti frutti, bubble gum, mm -hmm. wild cherry. It doesn't mm -hmm. really sound like that's being marketed to adults, is it? No, and, and that's something that the <clears throat> American Lung Association and, and all other nonprofits who really, um, and people in general who are worried about this, that they're kind of focused on is there's all of these flavors, like you mentioned, there's bubble gum, <laughs> cotton candy, apple juice, all these kind of kid flavors. And I think what's alarming and what really kind of speaks to the facts is that 83% of youth who use e-cigarettes are using flavored devices. So they're not using unflavored things, they're doing it for the flavor. And a lot of the marketing um, kind of has cartoons and it looks almost childish in what they're doing. So big tobacco really is targeting youth with those flavors, which is why so many people are, are focused on how do we get rid of the flavors? What can we do to prevent youth from using it? Because we've raised the age, yep. but they're still using it because that marketing piece is there. Of the important things, are these easy? We've always said that these are easy to obtain. Like I said, I made the wise crack pandemic. I couldn't buy toilet paper. I couldn't buy food. I couldn't buy Lysol. But you can go to your local street corner. And yes, this was, I do a drug show, obviously. Mm -hmm. And you could buy your drugs on the corner with no problem, no break in the chain. You can buy your vaping products. Why is that that you could buy vaping products, but we couldn't buy food, toilet paper, and Lysol? Yeah, I think it's just one of those things where what are our priorities, right? And so, you know, you have big tobacco, you have these corporations who want those products to continue and, and they want to make their income off of it. And so unfortunately, they're still available. And, and I think, um, you know, what was really troubling during the pandemic is to see that people were still able to get access to those products, were still using those products at alarming rates while we were dealing with a respiratory illness. Yeah, you know? well, we're gonna get into that later <laughs> in the show when we talk about the effects. Okay, what can you tell us about the effects of the lungs for someone who is vaping? Yeah, so in terms of vaping in the lungs, like I said, there's tons of chemicals that you're ingesting. So one of our like overarching things that we say at the Lung Association is nothing is good for your lungs but clean air. So I think there's <clears throat> always this question of is it safer than regular tobacco products? Is it not? And I think the reality is with whatever product you're using to smoke, whether it's e-cigarettes or traditional tobacco products, all of those chemicals and compounds are going into the lungs. So, you know, you're getting diactol, things that are in formaldehyde, all of these carcinogens, and you're taking those and putting them into your body. And so they've been known to cause lung disease, 
disease. They've been known to cause lung cancer, these chemicals and stuff. Um, they've been known to cause acute lung injury. A few years back, I think maybe when we did the first show, there was this uptick in what they called EVALI, um, where there was this rise in acute respiratory illness and injury related to e-cigarettes. So, Overall, you know, you're taking in chemicals, you're taking in ultrafine particles, and those are going to impact your lungs and have long-term lasting impacts. Now, I would like to break this up a little bit and not discuss COVID for a couple of minutes. If just on the lungs, the effect for someone that's no COVID, never going to get COVID, is on a deserted island, and he's <clears throat> vaping. Mm -hmm. What do I need to worry about as a parent and what's going into my lungs? If I was to start vaping, no COVID, just injury. Yeah, what? yeah. So again, you're taking in carcinogens, you're taking in particle pollution, you're taking in chemical compounds and the other pieces. There's all these chemicals that are initially in that e-juice, but as they're heated, they create new compounds. And so that goes into your lungs and it damages them and, and can cause issues with breathing, um, issues where you might get sick easier regardless of what the illness is. And so it's, it's that acute lung injury. Now these products, like I said, the mainstream, what we see today are newer to the market. They've been yeah. there for you know 15 to 20 years. And so they're still researching what those long-term impacts are. But I think the connection that we make is we know these chemicals in traditional tobacco products can cause cancer and, and have some of those other larger long-term impacts. So I think the thought is that that's likely what we'll see, you know, 10, 15 years from now as we look at the long-term impacts. But I think in terms of short-term impacts, there's that risk for this acute respiratory illness, trouble breathing, shortness of breath, and so on. I mean, I have to commend the ALA and the CDC and everybody else. But I remember two years ago when you were here, it was so much infancy. Rather than do our interview on speculation and what you thought, the ALA Lung Association was basically going by facts. They weren't going to sensationalize. They wanted to have the facts straight. And our entire interview was basing on what information they had at that time putting a responsible message out. Not what they thought was happening, not what we think. And in two years, I mean two years, now look at what we're able to talk about because the facts are in, we realize the damage that's being done, and they can speak honestly and openly after research and many organizations like the FDA, the CDC, and everybody else, and the Surgeon General can now back say, yeah, what we knew all along, we have proven. Now to get into the big question, COVID. Mm -hmm. I've already done some damage. I'm not gonna say the percentage, that's your job. You've done some damage to your lungs and now you have got COVID on top of vaping. Why should I worry? Yeah, so I think one of the things that has come out over the past year with COVID is just that, you know, using what we found is that using any tobacco product, whether it's traditional cigarettes or e-cigarettes, that doing that and then getting COVID, it, you know, it, it can be more complicated. It can, you know, you can have more long-term lasting impacts and that's because COVID is a respiratory illness. So if you're smoking or if you're using an e-cigarette, you're taking in all of that those particles, all of those chemicals, you're damaging your lungs. And then on top of that, you get a respiratory illness. It's going to be so much harder to fight it off and you're going to have so much more difficulty keeping your lungs healthy as you're, you're fighting it off and, and using these products. So it really just is, in, in my eyes, a recipe for a disaster to, to get you know, a respiratory illness while you're constantly doing injury to your lungs through these products. And I understand also on COVID, you lose about 30% uh, of your lung capacity over time. It might not happen today, but if you catch COVID down the road, COPD, other problems, emphysema, uh, bronchitis, you have all these issues because you've lost about 30%. Just to get a little knowledge on COVID, it's not a nice, friendly, little cute particle that we see that picture. COVID has a nasty habit. It has a fish hook on the spike. What that does is microscopically makes little tiny tears. And the tear, what happens when you cut your hand, you cut your finger, cut your face, you get scar tissue. Well, you can't exchange in the alveoli. Yes, I said that right, alveoli. <laughs> um, it causes little microscopic tears. That scars over. What the alveoli does is it allows the oxygen you're breathing in to mix into the bloodstream and oxygenate that blood. Well, when it's filled with scar tissue, the more scar tissue, the harder it is for that oxygen to get into your bloodstream. And you depend on oxygenated blood to function, to keep your brain alive, your heart and all your organs alive. Now that you've done this, and now that we have this background, how am I helping myself by putting in this vaping on top of what I've just done to my body. Yeah, so you're not. Obviously, you're talking about scar tissue and then damaging it more with these products. So I think 
One of the things that I'll be interested to see some more research on is, you know, there was for a while this focus on this age range of kind of young adults into middle aged where they were having a lot of complications with COVID. And some of the initial thought was that might have to do with e-cigarette yeah. use. So I'll be interested <clears throat> to see kind of where that research goes and the connections they can make. But obviously, if you're having all of these holes in this scar tissue and then you're vaping alongside that and putting chemicals into that scar tissue, it's, it's just gonna create more complications for people. And of course we're in our infancy and this hasn't happened yet because if time goes on, our bodies get older. Let's face it, we don't get younger, we get older. Now you've got the uh, effects from COVID and now all these chemicals are gonna catch up with you. It's taken 30, 40 years. Remember when smoking came out, it was quote, the cool thing to do. Everybody was doing it. Oh, it can't hurt me, I might catch a cough. And then we started catching up over the years and seeing the cancer develop and all the different diseases. Well, again, vaping is in such infancy. That's why the Lung Association was so responsible on my last show. I, I'm gonna talk openly. I wanted Amber to say more on the last show. I really did. <laughs> but being responsible and not to sensationalize, you based our interview on the facts you had at hand. Mm -hmm. And I'm, of course, running a show. I wanted to say more. Mm -hmm. But David, we can't say that. <laughs> So now we're going to learn more and more about the effects of vaping and the effects of COVID and the combination of both. And I can't even begin to imagine down the road 10, 20 years from now when you put these two things together. Now, oh my God, I had COVID and I've been vaping for 10 years. What do I do? Mm -hmm. I had no idea X, Y, Z was going to happen because we haven't established it yet. Well, exactly. And I think there are, you know, when you think about all the different organs in your body, the lungs are you know, anything you're breathing in is going into your lungs. And so it's one of, you know, there's so many things to worry about in yeah. life and, and all of these different things. But I think what's important is that you <clears throat> not only um, try not to use these products, but if others are using them, try to keep yourself away. Um, because there also has been some research that has started about secondhand kind of taking in secondhand yeah. vape emissions and what impacts COVID has on those populations who are maybe around someone doing that more often. So. I will be interested to see, but I, I don't think that what we're going to see is going to be good because, again, you're injuring your lungs and then you're kind of around these toxic chemicals and just injuring them for, further. Can you comment a little further on that? Or what were you guys worried about with this happening? I mean, we, you have an audience. Last time you were here, I talked to the high school kids. They said, A, they could relate to you. You weren't like mother preaching to them. I'm like, like father preaching to them. For some reason, they listen to me. I don't know why I'm that happy that they do. But I'm just a tool to allow guests like yourself come in and share with what your knowledge on what we can do. And they sort of connected with you. They just said, you know, I didn't care. You can speech all day. I hear it on TV, CNN, Fox News, Fauci. They really don't want to listen to that because that's somebody big government preaching to them. And then mom and dad, what do they know? They've only been my parents for years. They've been through it already, but they don't know anything. You came on as a source that they say, you know, you're speaking from the heart. I speak from the heart. I do this as a volunteer. I don't get paid for any of this. I love doing it because as an EMT, like any healthcare provider, we want to save lives. And I have this ability to bring excellent guests in that you can listen to and gather your information from. So now that you've got some incredible sitting here right from the Lung Association, why should I worry? Yeah, so I I think, you know, when when we talk about youth using products, you want to make sure that they understand the risks that are out there. And I remember back when I was in high school, you know, I thought I could do things and it wouldn't really impact me long term. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we can see and what we can say is that the research and the science shows that youth using these products leads to so many other issues mm -hmm. down the road. And, and I just think back to myself when I was 17, 16, 17, 18, and I wasn't thinking about some of those long-term things, but I think it's important if, if you're in that age range for you to sit back and think about what you want your future to look like. And if you want to be able to run and keep up with your family, your kids, a pet, whoever, these, these products are going to make that more difficult to do. You're gonna be short of breath. You're not gonna be able to keep up. You could potentially get cancer down the road. Um, you know, you could have all of these issues. And, and I think when people, when you think about what they wanna do with their future, it's not be short of breath and not be able to get up off the couch because of a decision I made when I was younger, you know, due to this marketing. Uh, and I think in terms of maybe what parents could do or what adults could do is it's important to have a conversation with with 
youth and with others, I think a lot of people when they think about vaping devices think, oh, my kid wouldn't do that or, oh, you know, my niece or nephew wouldn't do that. But the reality is, is that youth vaping, it really kind of transcends all of the stereotypes. You made a comment earlier about how to, uh, using traditional cigarettes was a cool thing to do. And I remember when my parents were in high school, yeah. they had, they smoked in the bathroom, yeah, yeah. you know, that was like the typical thing to do. And then when I got to high school, it was like this one group of people were, was the group who smoked, who used tobacco yeah. products. And I think what we've seen with vaping that is extremely troubling is it's not one particular group, it kind of transcends all the groups. So you have people in the band, on sports yeah. teams, like <clears throat> chess team, wherever, um, who are doing it because it's easy to hide. There's all these enticing flavors. They think, you know, everyone's doing it. It's just water vapor, it's no big deal. So I think it's important to know that there are these chemicals and there are these lasting long-term effects. And so as a parent or guardian, a trusted adult, it's important to have those conversations and educate youth. Obviously, you don't want to be preaching to them, but there is a wide array of resources available for how to have those conversations in a meaningful way to, to be able to help you through that decision-making process, how to help them understand how to say no, and so on. What can you as the American Lung Association share with us? What do you have available? Yeah, so a couple of things um, specifically for youth and then um, something for adults. So we have for youth our Not on Tobacco program, which yep. is a youth cessation program. So you do have to have an adult go through and become a facilitator for that. So they go through a training with the <coughs> Lung Association and then um, the facilitator is able to kind of have these group meetings where people who want to quit, youth who want to quit vaping or using any tobacco product can go through different sessions and understand the dangers of using these products and how to go about saying no, how to start on their quit journey and so on. Um, we also have our in-depth program, which is a program for schools to be able to use. It's an alternative to suspension program uh, where again, we're educating youth about the dangers of using these products and using it instead of a punitive measure. One of the things that I think a lot of schools started to do when vaping devices became more mainstream is they would just suspend students. If they are found with the device, you got suspended. And, and what we've learned is that that is not going to kind of deter students from behavior. I went and spoke at a school um, and Western Massachusetts and they had uh, suspended I want to say 17 people of a 25 person classroom Whoa. all in a week for vaping so it just obviously is not going to have a positive impact so so wanting to make sure that you educate youth try to talk through them through that decision-making process that's always going to be your best bet and then I think one of the most exciting things is that we actually are in the process of developing an app for your phone. Okay. Our Not On Tobacco app will be released uh, next fall, so I think in the September timeframe, and that will be a free app that you can download in your Amazon I, you know, iPhone, wherever, at your, whatever app store you use, yeah. you'll be able to download it for free there. and and it will have kind of all of these things related to quitting and I think just will be a great way to engage youth. I think everyone has a cell phone these days, so we figured we would bring that program, so our traditional not program that we would hold in person, bring it to kind of the digital space for youth to be able to use. And then there are a wide array of resources on our website. That's what's gonna ask yeah, you about the website. Yeah, on, on our website, lung.org. So there's um, a nice guide for parents to be able to talk to youth, a guide. It's called Get Your Head Out of the Clouds. It's a campaign okay. that we yeah, did Yeah, I with saw that on TV. So. Yeah, so we did that with the Ad Council. And so there's a nice guide for kind of how to talk to youth about e-cigarettes and vaping and the dangers associated with it. And it really breaks it down um, so that you can understand maybe where they're coming from and, and say things in a way that, that is gonna be beneficial to them. And then for adults, we have our Freedom From Smoking program, which is available in four modalities. I won't give a ton of detail, but uh, we do offer in-person sessions. We're kind of on pause right now, but we'll be resuming those here shortly. And then we also have um, a digital Freedom From Smoking Plus, Plus program, but that really is our cessation program for adults. Yeah. So whether it's traditional tobacco products or if you're an e-cigarette user, we've updated all of these programs over the last two-ish years to really incorporate e-cigarettes into, into our talking points, into our discussion points, and into the materials that we're using.
well, the last two years you put a lot into it. Yes, yes. And especially, I think we did a lot of ap adaptations to things during COVID. Um, I think although we're dealing with this respiratory illness, people obviously still want to quit and, and have that urge to. So we have, we were offering for quite some time some free memberships into our Freedom From Smoking Plus program as a way to, to kind of help people out during their quit journey when we weren't able to have in-person clinics. Now, something's been bugging me, and it has to do with the flavoring. I mentioned before, tutti frutti, bubble gum, cotton candy. Why is there such a focus in removing these flavored cigarettes from the market? Yeah, so big tobacco for a number of years from traditional tobacco products, when, you know, when they were created through now with all of these new vaping products, they have always targeted youth. Um, we feel that way with the flavors. Again, I said it earlier, 83% of youth are using flavored products. So if 83% of them are using flavored products, I think you just connect the dots and realize if you got rid of the flavors, it might help out the problem as a whole because not many are using unflavored products. So we here locally in Massachusetts, but as well as nationally have really been advocating for the ban on flavors uh, just because adults aren't using them at the rates that youth are. So why, why would we have them if that's what's happening? So when Massachusetts was kind of doing some work to ban all flavors back in 2019, 2020, uh, we were really supportive and worked with the Heart Association, with the Cancer Society mm -hmm. to go ahead and kind of push for, forth some legislation, give some testimonies to really help um, people understand the importance of banning those flavors so that we can lessen the amount of youth using the products. Um, you know, I can personally attest to something. Over Christmas, I can see how people get hooked on things. I got a, what was it, 140 of, I'm not gonna give a free plug to the candy industry, but a particular candy product that's common in the stores. And I take a couple of day because I like the flavor. I didn't really like the chocolate, I just like the flavor. And you know, over time later at night, I'm sitting there watching TV. Oh, that tastes good, I think another one. Next thing I know, I'm eating five, six of these little, cute little chocolate things. Again, I'm not gonna give a free plug, but it was the flavor and the Christmas special flavors and the seasonal flavors only available. And I can see now why when they do the cigarettes and the e-cigs and you put the flavoring in them, I wasn't doing it to eat the chocolate. I wasn't hungry. I just like to think, oh, I think I like the flavor. It makes me feel good. I popped a couple of these things just for the flavor. And in no shape or form was even hungry. So what role did the American Lung Association have in stopping flavored cigarettes in mass? I understand that for the cigarette itself, you were able to stop that. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so we have an advocacy team as well as I'm on our health promotions team. Mm -hmm. And so we're always working to make sure that we give testimony as kind of bills go up to try and pass, um, that we're trying to educate legislators about uh, why a certain bill is important. So why, you know, fr from their perspective, they may not know anything about cigarettes and, and why flavors matter. So really using that as an opportunity to educate and let them know why, why that sort of ban matters and, and who it would impact most. Uh, so we do that. We also work with people locally, volunteers who want to kind of help out with mm -hmm. that and allow them to make phone calls, to join in on sign-on letters, and really just try to push forward the appropriate means to make sure that we are protecting youth and, and protecting people from the harmful effects of these devices. Now, what role do you have in trying to stop the menthol cigarettes that are all across the U.S. and Massachusetts? What can you tell us about that campaign? Yeah, so I think most people know by now, but President Biden is actually proposing a menthol ban across the board, and that is something that our organization is very much supportive of at the national level, but locally as well. It's the same sort of thing. Um, once you kind of eliminate those more kid flavors, so the yeah. tutti frutti, the bubble gum, <clears throat> the next thing that kids jump to is that menthol piece. And yeah. so they, they don't like the taste of the actual product. They, they just like the, the additives and that flavoring. So again, if, if you can ban that menthol piece, if you can ban the flavors, then it makes it less enticing to them. So it's something that we've been trying to push forward at you know, every state across the country, our advocacy team is working that and working on that. And then at the national level, very supportive and, and very feel feel like there's a lot of promise, a lot of promising and hope for the future with Biden's um, recent initiative. Rather than wait for all that, what about communities? As a community itself, what can the community do to try to lower the rate of smoking while we're waiting for this ban? 
Yeah, so I think obviously you can do ordinances and things like that at the local level, but I think the other piece is just that knowledge piece and, and making sure people are aware. People are aware, you know, not only of the risks, but of what these devices look like. So if you see something, saying something, um, you know, and I know that can be difficult at times, but, but it's just kind of having that watchful eye and, and letting people know. And then when things come up and, and you're able to make an impact, so if there's a local ordinance or a state um, item up for legislature, like for the legislature to look at, you know, really making phone calls, writing in letters, letting people know why this issue is important to you as a constituent, you know, as a resident of Massachusetts. And then I think, again, at the national level, making sure that you are voting in people who are going to fight for the issues that are important to you. And, and in reality, this issue impacts so many people. I think um, there probably isn't a person watching this show or anywhere who doesn't know someone who smokes or use a mm -hmm. vaping device. So I think it's something that should be important and at everyone's forefront. Um, it's from our perspective a bipartisan issue, uh, but I think locally just kind of making sure you're knowledgeable. If you have a, um, someone you know who uses, pointing them to the resources that we have at the Lung Association as well as um, resources that are available in Massachusetts through the quit line and, and so on. So as an individual, what's the best step I could do? I have a loved one, I have a family member, a friend, or a co-worker that you can't stand smelling or stinks of smoke all day. Mm -hmm. What can I as an individual do to help that person? So I think the first piece is that you can't ever force someone to quit. So you wanna have the conversation and maybe understand why they're doing it. A lot of times uh, people are doing it just because it's a habit and they mm -hmm. can't kick the habit. They wish they could. And so for those people who want to quit but maybe are addicted and, and aren't able to kick the habit, really pushing them to reach out to long.org, reach out to the Massachusetts quit line and, and begin that quit journey. You wanna make sure they're using a proven effective model. I touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think some people start vaping because they wanna quit and they think it will help. And, and really science and, and research has shown the opposite where people who are using those devices to quit actually end up becoming dual users. So they'll vape when they're out with their family and friends because they feel like it's more acceptable, but then at home they'll just smoke yeah. traditional cigarettes. Uh, so I think making sure that people are using an FDA approved method along with some sort of either group support group to quit like our freedom from smoking program or you know another local program so that you have kind of the psychological support around you and then also you know you can use a pharmacological piece as well so the patch the gum those sorts of things that are proven effective uh, but if a family member came to me I think you know again you just want to see where they're at if they're not interested at all you can't you can't force them so I think you try to educate them about the dangers let them know that that they matter to you and that you don't want to see any of those lasting health impacts on them. Uh, but really, they have to come to that conclusion that they want to quit on their own in order to kind of make those steps forward. I see all the accomplishments and developments you've done over the last year. Unfortunately, 2020, because of COVID, all fundraisers for every organization were canceled. You couldn't go out of the house. Mm -hmm. Never mind do a walkathon or a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. What did the ALA do at that point to try to raise funds? Yeah, so it's been obviously a very challenging year for our organization as well as so many organizations, businesses, whatever, across the state and nationally. So we really pivoted over the last year. We did a lot of virtual fundraisers for quite some time. So virtual walks, virtual climbs, yeah. virtual bike treks. We held uh, an event, a virtual event with Queen Latifah, which was a great, um, our COVID-19 action initiative, which was a great um, opportunity for us. But we are really excited to start kind of going back and having some sense of normalcy. Uh, so we had our first in-person event here in kind of in the New England area just this past weekend in Providence. Uh, we had an outdoor fight for air climbs. So our organization for many years has done these stair climbs. And here in Massachusetts, we've done it at one Boston place traditionally where thousands of people, including mm -hmm. firefighters mm -hmm. in their full uniform, would climb, come and climb up all the steps of the building. We'd have this nice after party. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously because of COVID, we can't get back to that traditional piece quite quite yet, but really excited that at the end of June, we'll be holding an outdoor climb at Fenway Park for people this year. We did that in Providence this past weekend and, and it was very well received, I will say. I have heard it is much more difficult than our regular traditional yeah. climb because you're going up and down. Yeah. <laughs> um, but excited to be able to be outdoors. And then 
Um, we traditionally always in the spring have done outdoor walks um, here in Massachusetts and then in the surrounding states. So excited that the first weekend in June we'll be having our uh, walk at the Franklin Park Zoo. And then we are excited that we'll be bringing back our um, Autumn Escape bike trek on the Cape uh, in September, doing it a little bit differently to, to make sure that we're keeping riders safe, but there will be an overnight option and, and just excited to be back in person, of course, following all of the protocol to keep people safe, but just, uh, just a nice time and, and a change of pace after the past year. Oh, that's an event that's on near and dear to my heart. What can you tell our viewers real quickly about what Autumn Escape is, for those that don't know? Yeah, so traditionally we have done a bike trip across uh, Cape Cod, and so bikers start, and then it's a three-day trek, um, hundreds of miles along the way, and it's kind of an all-inclusive ride where we do the accommodations, the food, there's a lobster dinner, we do Trek Tent City with all of these tents uh, for our the teens who come, and and just really an empowering moment for people to be able to ride all these miles uh, for others with lung disease and, and the money raised goes back to our mission. So research, education, and advocacy across the country, as well as locally here in Massachusetts. And when we say bike is we're referring to bicycle. Yes, bicycle, <laughs> not motorcycle. <laughs> so you're pedaling all of those miles. Joy and happiness. Yes. <laughs> What if I don't want a bicycle? How can I help support the American Lung Association? What if I don't want to climb up and down Fenway? What can I do to support you without riding? Yeah, so there's a couple of options. I think as we transition to in-person events, again, it has been difficult to find volunteers, number mm -hmm. one. Um, traditionally, these events were held at different times of the year, and we really kind of capitalized on college students. We had a lot of college students who came and volunteered with yeah. us, and <clears throat> obviously we're doing them a little bit later, so those students aren't there. So we're looking for volunteers, but also you can donate to the events. You don't have to participate, but you can make a donation. Uh, so if you're interested in doing that, you can visit lung.org and search for the events. So the um, Fenway Park, our climb, and then the Boston Lung Force Walk, mm -hmm. as well as our Autumn Escape bike track. You can search for those on lung.org, and then you would be able to donate on the event pages themselves. Do you have any last words for our viewers? I'm going to turn it over to you. What would you like to tell our viewers as a final thought? Yeah, so I just think, you know, throughout the past year, everyone has had a difficult time as COVID-19, a respiratory illness, has kind of fought its way across the world and across our country. And so I think one of the things that anyone can do on a day-to-day -day basis <clears throat> is take preventative measures to make sure that you're keeping your lungs healthy. And so in terms of vaping, that means if you are someone who vapes, getting the resources you need to quit, or if you're someone who's not vaping, never starting, because it's just going to progressively um, create some issues or challenges um, down the road for you in terms of lung health. So if you are looking for resources, I invite you to visit lung.org to learn more about our programs and to learn more about the risks associated with e-cigarettes, or if you're looking for information um, or would like to talk to someone about resources, you can call our Lung Helpline at 1-800-LUNG-USA. Very easy number to remember. Yes. Okay, I would like to thank our guest, Amber Pelletier, for appearing today. As always, thank you for watching. Please share this program with your social media friends. If someone you know is suffering from a substance abuse disorder, you can contact the Mass Substance Use Helpline at 1-800-327-5050. The show can be seen on a rotating basis on movement public media stations and on demand at their website and on YouTube. As always, I want to thank the wonderful staff of movement public media for making this show possible. Please enjoy our closing theme, Rive Above the Noise by Fireheart. That song, once again, is Rise Above the Noise by the group Fireheart, who actually was a guest on our show. Joe and Joni Murphy came on about 10 shows ago, something you definitely want to see. Now, please. Stay through the important credits. There's going to be contact information for all our past guests that have appeared. If you want to get in contact with them, we have contact information at the end of the show. So please watch all the way through. For America in Crisis, Breaking the Cycle of Addiction, my name is David Hunt. And again, thank you everybody for watching. Those you judge might never die. Above the noise, you hear us cry. There are people who can listen to the sound of the air Rise above the noise in the air The sound not heard is what we bear
whispers that I hear behind my back. For those who never lost a child.